Our second phrase, I think, I'm not sure if I sent the right lyrics to assuming something might be missing, but if it happens, um, but just for that, I think it's gonna be okay.
Sing that with different languages as well. Okay, we shall sing uh, one more praise and then uh, we'll pray as we continue with our worship. Yes, it 
understand everybody play, praises like that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Our dear Father God, I know sometimes we uh, take it for granted when we sing praises to you or we, when we worship you, Lord, uh, when it, it just feels like normal um, activity that, Lord, we do every time. But I ju do just want to thank you that, Lord, um, regardless of that, you still call us uh, that we may worship you, Lord, and sing praises to you, Lord. I pray that, Lord, you may touch our hearts, that every time of worship, Lord, may be a time where we encounter the living God, the creator of the heavens and earth. That even now, Lord, I pray that as we begin this worship and as we continue with it, Lord, the Lord, your presence will be with us. The Lord will be changed uh, from becoming people that are probably uh, bound by other things uh, into becoming creatures that right now, Lord, can glorify you the most. Uh, we lay down everything and we ask you that, Lord, you may fill us with the filling of the Holy Spirit, that we may push back all the gates of hate, Lord, so the Lord, this worship will be the greatest worship of our lives today. We give you thanks and praise, and I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The last reading comes from Acts 16. Uh, Paul came also to Dab and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of all because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered them, deli they delivered to them for observance, the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was coming there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we have made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women that who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her own as much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. 
for when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison, the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they've beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they, they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Let's pray. Let's pray. Um, our Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for this time. Uh, thank you, Lord, uh, as we see in these passages, in these words we've uh, just read in Acts 16, um, how, Lord, you can change a time of no answers into becoming a turning point of greatest answers, Lord, to the evangelists that the Lord is holding to the promise uh, of your gospel. Uh, we, we know that, Lord, uh, many times we go out to the field and we meet people like uh, like this Lydia or this jailer, um, but also we know that it is not because they are very good or prepared, but it's because, Lord, you work by your grace to open their hearts. And therefore, Lord, I pray that wherever your people go, even throughout this week, as they meet uh, with students, as they meet with colleagues, as they meet with family, as they meet with um, whoever, Lord, they meet uh, together this week, Lord, I pray that uh, you may walk uh, your grace in the hearts of each and everyone, the Lord, we count as evangelism targets. So the Lord, you can uh, open their hearts to receive the gospel and receive your word just the way, Lord, you did uh, for Paul and his team. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of the gospel, uh, this promise of mercy and this promise of victory. Uh, Lord, I know as evangelists, sometimes we might be bound by our own thinking or following some fixed notions or sometimes, Lord, having been influenced with this pragmatic culture that, Lord, we're growing up uh, these days. But I pray that, Lord, you may truly give us the grace today to hold on to your promise and to believe in the promise of your mercy. That, Lord, when the gospel is preached and people turn away from their sins, the Lord, you are very willing to relent from your, uh, from your wrath and welcome them in, O oh God, as people that, that are saved uh, for the worship and the glory of your name. We pray the Lord may also give us the grace to believe and hold on to the promise of a victory. The Lord, as we preach the gospel, we're not just doing this because it's an act of service as Christians, but we are proclaiming the gospel knowing that this gospel can save, this gospel can change, this gospel can revive, this gospel can heal, 
this gospel can restore and turn around things, Lord, even in a way that, Lord, we've never heard or never uh, seen before. Therefore, Lord, I pray for this nation and for the city, Lord, as per what, Lord, we have seen in the last many years or probably the last many decades, uh, people with very hard hearts, people with a very stubborn mentality, people rebellious, and sometimes even showing their evil without shame. But Lord, we know that as we preach the gospel in the streets of Birmingham each and every single week, each and every single day, we trust, Lord, that your promise will be fulfilled. The Lord shall change these hearts of stone to become hearts of flesh, where, Lord, these lost people, Lord, will be able to hear the gospel and come back to you, Lord, to be raised and established, Lord, as your disciples, for the glory and honor of your name. Therefore, Lord, in this worship service, we pray the Lord you may truly have mercy upon the city. The Lord may remember not only missionaries in the city, Lord, but we pray for missionaries even in other places of this world, Lord, today, even as they proclaim your gospel, the Lord, you will hear them. The Lord, you will lead them. The Lord, you will truly attach to them, people like Lydia and this jailer, that they'll be saved. And even though persecutions may arise, that Lord, we shall stand with the gospel without being shaken or without even being wavered. Uh, we give you thanks, Lord, in this time. I remember Birmingham Presbyterian Church, Lord, and all the members, especially this afternoon, Lord, I want to remember Mandy. And even for this difficult time, the Lord, she is going through. The Lord, you will preserve her faith that whatever difficulties she is going through right now because of this illness, the Lord, you will truly give her faith and preserve it, oh God. I know Satan is after her faith, is after her heart, Lord. And we will probably try to use this uh, sickness or this time of difficulty to deceive her and even steal assurance, Lord, from her heart. But we bind all those forces of darkness in Jesus' name. And we pray the Lord you will truly preserve her heart, that we protect her, Lord, and shade her under your wings, Lord, that she may come out strong, she may come out even more passionate and zealous, Lord, for Christ and his gospel. The Lord, she will truly enter into the second phase of her life. The Lord, she will use this life, Lord, for your glory. Lord, heal her, we pray. The Lord may have mercy upon her today. We know that, Lord, maybe we have members uh, that have problems or going through situations, the Lord, they can't even share with us, oh God. But Lord, you know them. Lord, you hear them. Lord, you see them. How, Lord, I pray that you may grant that, Lord, they find you and find your grace and find answers, Lord, in you and in you alone, oh God. May you condescend on them, Lord, by your word and by your covenant and to truly uh, strengthen them for the Lord. And I pray as we pray in the morning, the Lord, it's not only about healing or removing the problem away from them, but I pray that, Lord, you can also change those problems to become pedestals and even platforms where, Lord, they can enjoy grace and strength of Christ even more. We give you thanks, Lord, in this time. We pray for the upcoming church events that, Lord, we have ahead of us as we are coming to summer, Lord, thinking about training evangelism camp, both in Birmingham and even outside of Birmingham. We pray for Malvern and I thank you for the devotional God. God, I pray that we continue to open the doors there, that we may proclaim Christ and even establish systems, Lord, that we continue, Lord, with your work in this place, so God, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for the plan uh, of this invitation that, that, that we have received, Lord, from Wales. Uh, the Lord, you may continue to guide us and to see how best we can serve your people, Lord, in this nation, so that, Lord, the gospel of Christ will be restored in this nation for your glory. We praise you, Lord, and we worship you. Now, as we enter into hearing your word being preached, God, give us ears to hear your word. Illumine our hearts, Lord. Give us understanding. Give us courage to hold on to your word without choosing a word, Lord, fits with that. Let us just, Lord, receive your word in the way that, Lord, you're giving us today. We give you thanks and I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Romans 16, verse 22. The book of Romans is one verse that is in the chapter 16, and the verse is 22. I, Tashes, 
who wrote this letter. Greet you in the Lord. Amen. Um, I'm preaching from the whole maybe um, chapter, but we just focus on uh, 22 for now. Uh, Romans 16. Um, it's very easy to go through Romans 16 and don't even have a feeling that is an important chapter. Uh, it could be just like uh, Paul just greeting his friends or those who helped him saying thank you to them or those who helped the church. From, especially from verse 1 to verse 16, all you see just na names of men, names of women, uh, families being referred to, and even sometimes you see siblings being mentioned together. The, the five brothers, for example, that are being mentioned uh, in this uh, chapter. Uh, in Paul's ministry and throughout the early church, the role of uh, men and women in the church was very distinct. Uh, there were roles in the church where only men were allowed uh, to hold and to perform those roles. Uh, and apart from that, there were roles where both men and women were allowed uh, to perform. <coughs> um, one of these roles that was only a main role uh, in the early church was the church offices. Uh, the office of eldership, especially when it comes to teaching elders, uh, that was a very male role in the early church. And still even today, many reformed churches are uh, holding to that stand. Uh, the role of men as elders, whether ruling elders or uh, teaching elders was a very uh, strong uh, office in the early church. But one of the other roles that is, um, or the other names that are being uh, mistaken today is the office of deaconship or deacons in the church. Uh, in the book of 1 Timothy 3 and uh, Titus 3, we see that this is also our only men office. So the early church, they never appointed uh, any women to take up the office of, uh, of the deacons. But in Romans 16, we see Paul naming or calling Phoebe a deaconess. And um, the reason is the kind of our deacon that she was, Phoebe, and many other women that we see in, you know, in the book of Romans and even in other, uh, in other letters of Paul, uh, these were women who did not just, they, they did not hold the office of a deacon uh, as, the, as the office uh, that is given to uh, only the men alone, but these were women that worked hand in hand with Paul. They worked with him so close. Paul calling them deaconesses, deacon. Phoebe is one of them that is mentioned here. And we see even Priscilla is another one that is mentioned in, in, in verse three. These are women that really worked so closely with Paul. So this is uh, it's not a deacon in terms of the office of a church when it comes to church governance, but this is a role that was both for men and for women. And I would say that this is the main role for any believer, for any Christian. It's not just an office in a church that does, uh, you know, uh, does administer policies or govern the church in teaching doctrine and other things. This role that we see in Romans 16, everyone that has been mentioned here, they did a role that was very, very good and was a role that every Christian should be able to um, take. And what role is this? Is the role of preaching the gospel. Both men and women and even children are called by God himself to preach the gospel. It's not a specific role or a task that some people alone are supposed to handle it, but every Christian who is born again and believes in the promises of the gospel as we saw in the morning, we are all called as preachers of the gospel. Preachers of the gospel. We've had these words, field marshal or field commander or just simply evangelist. And therefore, that's why it's a call for every Christian to be trained. And the message today is an evangelist that receives training. So it is a call for every Christian to receive training. Um, yesterday, Jess was telling me about something about training and how people, some people in some kind of um, professions are trained to run towards danger. 
like firemen, for example, when there's fire in this building and the fire alarm goes off, all of us will be wanting to get out of the building. But there will be people right now driving so fast to come here, and the intention is to get inside the building. And in all those professions, I've thought in my head, whether it's, it is police officers, when there is a bomb blast at New Street, for example, we're all running away, but some police officers will be running towards New Street Station. Uh, they're doing that for only two reasons. Or when army, you know, ma the Marines, when they hear a blast, they want to go there. And one reason is to eradicate the, you know, the harm or the danger, but the other reason is to save lives. That's why they would stake theirs and run towards the danger to try to save lives. So in other words, every believer, every Christian is called to stake their lives, put it in the harm's way, that they may eradicate the danger that is potentially there or to save one life. What happens if you don't preach the gospel in, in Birmingham today? This whole place will be occupied by cults, false religions. So that's the harm. Every day you preach the gospel, you are eradicating that kind of a harm. You're potentially going to meet a disciple and that through that disciple, you're able to continue to relay this precious gospel. That's why evangelists, and we are all our evangelists, we are called to enter into training, lifelong training. And in the conclusion, I might mention what exactly that training is about. Tasha's here is mentioned, Phoebe is mentioned, and many others are mentioned. Uh, it's not the one who actually wrote the letter. Uh, he was there as a scribe. Uh, Paul spoke to him and he, uh, he just, uh, so Paul just dictated and he just wrote everything down, just inscribing it. Uh, Phoebe is the one that potentially took this letter and went with it to Rome and read it for the church in Rome. So they probably didn't even know that maybe one day this very simple task, this very simple job, that one day is going to turn into becoming a world-class masterpiece that even today we're blessed with it. All that Tashis did was just sit there and write things down that Paul is dictating. Phoebe only just traveling. She was a businesswoman. Maybe she was just anyway going to, to Rome anyways. But she was able to take this letter to Rome with her and read it for them over there. But today they have received these eternal answers that we hear about them even 2,000 years uh, down the line. So just like them, we are called to receive these historic answers through the work of the church and even through the work of the headquarters, these historic answers. Some of the answers that we have received, uh, I'm not really in a position of giving many details about it, but uh, these are historic answers that have come uh, to the church, historic answers. historic answers coming in the church. And I'd like us to think about two things in this uh, topic of training today. Uh, the spiritual power that comes through training. We're gonna talk about it. And the other one, it would be uh, your walk of faith that is established through training. So training is really training, literally training. It's hard, it's time consuming, it's resources uh, consuming, it's difficult, there are challenges, you want to give up, but training is training. It is about thinking about the benefits that come from the training itself. You know, that's my motivation these days, I'm going to gym. I still, uh, maybe there is really nothing uh, to show you except just my, my app in my phone that as a proof that I'm going to gym. But I know that one day, um, even without seeing my phone, you can still, uh, oh, so Maurice, are you, are you going to gym? Maybe there'll be some evidence, I hope. Um, thinking about that, going there for 30 minutes, going there for one hour, it's a joy, it's a joy. Our senior pastor, Reverend John, he's uh, 76 and he's still, he's very fit and uh, he likes bragging a lot about it. So let me just help him with that a little bit over here. And apparently one day, one of his uh, secretaries was like, oh, pastor, I think you really love the gym. And he was like, shut up, you know, 
who loves you know uh, working out nobody does love that but it's just what you think that you're getting out of it it's much more easy uh to be a christian who just comes to church once a week or once a month or a festive christian during easter or during christmas it's much more easy like that you're still saved you're still a child of god you're still gonna go to heaven than waking up at 5 30 in the morning going to early morning prayers for the churches that have that some churches have lunchtime worship evening worship nighttime prayer you know special trainings intensive training and all those kind of things it's much more easier to not attend all of those things and just come to church during christmas or during baptism or during another event but training does really come with a lot of the promise of spiritual power paul writes about it again in one of his episodes training So the first power that comes with training is the power of the gospel. The second power is the power of prayer and the third is the power of evangelism. But I'm gonna, instead of just saying the power of the gospel, I'm, I'll be giving you um, a word or, or, or like a vocabulary in each and every one of these three powers I'm gonna mention today. So in the power of the gospel, I want you to focus on this word, the word of God. That's where the power of the gospel comes from. It comes from the word of God. The power of the gospel doesn't come from sermons like this or the one I gave you the morning. It comes from the word of God, from the Bible, if you might say. And what are we talking about here? It is the experiencing of the power of the gospel, experiencing in a way that you even know the importance of the power of the gospel and that you believe in it because your conclusion or your conviction comes from the scriptures. Not, not from a friend or from your parents or from your pastor. From the scriptures, as you study the scriptures, as you go down deep into the scriptures, you get convinced in your heart that there is a power of God revealed in, uh, in, in the gospel. And the reason I think, this is just my own reason, when you go to heaven, you can ask uh, Luke, you know, he wrote uh, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And he's the only one in the early church that wrote about the Acts of the Apostles. There were many other great writers. Paul was also a great one as well. There are many disciples of Jesus. There are many 120 people that were left by Jesus in the Mark's upper room. None, nobody, none of them saw the importance. Just sit down and said, I'm going to write about the Acts of the Apostles. Writing about the power of the gospel. And why did he do that? Now, I, I'm going to give you uh, um, something that I think is probably the reason. In Luke chapter 1, in as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. Now, there's an evidence that there are many people who tried to compile a narrative. In as much as many, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been told. So he says, that here he followed all things very closely. He examined everything that was mentioned about what the gospel is. He has gone through the material. He has gone through the evidence. He has studied it deeply himself. And then somebody like him was used greatly by God, by the Holy Spirit to write down one of the most extensive report about the power of the gospel a very um, extensive report. You know the Christians in Berea, for example, the Christians in Berea, uh, who uh, received the word of God with eagerness. Uh, eagerness. If you look at uh, Acts 17, <clears throat> verse 10, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they 
went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And, you know, the work that took place in Berea as well, the great power of God was revealed there. The great power of God. So when you talk about the spiritual power that comes through, uh, through training, uh, we're talking about you experiencing the power of the gospel through training in the word of God. Training in reading the Bible. Training in finding out the meaning of the text that we have in the Bible. Because sometimes uh, we might just want to just watch a message and watch it again and watch it again and just finish with that. But if you depend on that, you can't really experience the power of the gospel. It is when you're trained to open the scriptures by yourself from Genesis to Revelation, and you're able to take any text there and to extract the meaning of that uh, text and apply it in your life. So it's not just the thesis alone, but it's also the application that is important here. That, my friends, you cannot do it by yourself. You have to be trained on how to do that. You have to be trained on how to do that. That is the only way you can gain roots in the gospel. Now, don't forget that the core of the word of God, the core of the scriptures is Christ. That's why when you study the word of God like that, you have no choice but to root down deeper and deeper into the mystery of Christ. And that's where the power comes from. The power comes from the roots that we have in the gospel. So um, this power of the gospel that we're talking about here is revealed depending on how um, much you're rooted in the gospel. That's why we need to receive training into that. Now, when I think of Paul, for example, um, when he met Christ in Acts 9, as Luke records there, uh, so he met Jesus. And Jesus said, I am Jesus, and say, okay, fine, you're Jesus. But he didn't begin his ministry right away. We know that he went to Ananias for three days. And as it was seen in the book of Galatians, he was in Arabia for 17 years or 14, depending on how you, you know, calculate uh, when he actually left to go to Arabia. So 14 to 17 years about, he was in, he was in Arabia receiving a training, deep rooting in the gospel. And because he rooted so deeply in the gospel when he came out from Arabia, we know very well of the kind of works that took place uh, through Apostle Paul. So spiritual power comes through training. The second training is the power of prayer. And here, the key word that I want to focus on, it is the promise of God. <laughs> that is in contrast with thinking about only the act of prayer, the act of prayer. So we have scheduled prayer, we have continuous prayer, special prayer, 9 p.m. prayer, but all of that is meaningless without us having very strong faith in the promise of God. In fact, we pray because God has given us a promise regarding prayer. Even Jesus himself was able to accomplish his ministry because of prayer. He depended on prayer very much. And again, it's not just about the action of prayer, but it's about trust and, uh, and, and faith and conclusion within, inside of the uh, promise of God. The third uh, power is the power of evangelism. We see that in Acts 1.8. And in the power of evangelism, what I want you to focus on as a keyword here is every day. That's the power of evangelism. It's not just one time going to, you know, London, a big park, and then there's like millions of people gathered, and then that's it. The power of evangelism is evangelism in your daily life every single day. That every day you are born 
as an evangelist. When you sleep, you sleep as an evangelist. When you wake in the morning, you wake as an evangelist. It's like you're being reborn as an evangelist each and every single day. Remember that. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, just think that you're being reborn as an evangelist. Being reborn as an evangelist. The second point uh, is walk of faith established through training. Uh, and here the focus is on the seven remnants in the Bible. Moses, David, all of these seven remnants, as we see them in the Bible, they are people that were really established through training. Psalm 78 verse 70 to 72, shows how they were trained in faith and also in skills. In other words, they were trained in spirituality. I like this analogy that Pastor John normally gives uh, of an eagle, how an eagle flies with two wings. Um, it can't fly with one wing. And those two wings are spirit spirituality and specialty. So you have to flip them very well. They're, they're not equal. They're not equal at all. But that's how much these seven remnants portray a classic training in the spiritual matters and classic training in their field of specialties. And they found balance within that Psalm 78, verse 70 to 72. You know, when you try to picture how David rescued his flock from the jaws of bears and lions, obviously he went with prayer but he also was very skilled in what he did. And all of them, all the seven remnants, Joseph was very good in sweeping the floor. That's all he did. But one day he found himself sitting on the throne of the Egyptian office of the prime minister or governor. They were established like this because of training. If you look down deep into their lives, Moses, you know, probably one of the people in the Bible that were, were able to, uh, they were able to be raised very well, uh, you know, from their younger age. How his mom sent him to the palace and then she goes in as a maid. Because she, she knew the importance of this child. And she was able to really raise Moses uh, until uh, he became this leader that he himself was very surprised to find himself as a leader like that. And the other thing that we see with them, the seven remnants, is that they led, they, they led a life that saved people. They led a life that saved people. They were trained. They were trained to save lives. They were trained to go into danger to save lives. And if we had time, we can really go systematically through all of these remnants that we see in the Bible one by one, how they really saved people not just by, um, by joy and happiness all the time. Sometimes they really had to go into the danger. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, these people were thrown into the fire, into the lion's den. They put themselves like that in the harm's way that they may save people. That's why I don't know when, but I, I remember you know, saying these words like, when you got saved, you who are enrolled in an army. It's just an enrollment. You're given a weapon, which is prayer, and you're in the front lines now. Certain archers are coming to you, and you have to defend yourself with faith, and then uh, continue uh, following Christ for his glory. So you're not called to bring disaster into people's lives, you're called to save them. They're called to save them. The other thing about the seven remnants, how they were established in training or through training, is that they received a life that remained in history. Romans 16, 22. All he did was just to write. Anyone can do that, obviously. But it was, whose letter are you writing? So he stood 
in the in the right place at the right time in history. Jokebed, I've mentioned about her. Rahab, what did Rahab do actually? Just hide the spies. When the police came, she says, oh, I haven't seen them. That's it. And her name now has received these historic answers. Mary, Damar, Esther, etc. cetera. Uh, they portray that life of a remnant where uh, for being established in the word of God, by believing in the promises of God, we see how God has uh, really used them greatly to remain uh, even in history. Now let's conclude uh, this message about training today. <clears throat> uh, soon we'll begin training. We've been uh, discussing this and uh, thinking about what's the best way to do. I uh, will give you information as, uh, as, it, as it comes, but it seems like we'll probably begin training on a full scale next year. Um, but we might have like a once a month training day uh, after worship just in the evening for those who are really uh, those, who, those who really think of themselves as the main figures of UK evangelization, that, that will be only, the only condition to attend the trainings. Um, but maybe next year we'll have a more systematized uh, or systematic uh, trainings for all of us. But it's a prayer that we really hold onto the covenant of God as we enter into training and as we pray for it. And the reason is, I'm going to finish by telling you the true meaning of, of training. What does training really mean? And for that, I'll read a verse in the book of Hebrews 4, verse 16. Hebrews 4, 16 reads, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So it's a call to draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Um, so it's a call for you to draw to the throne of grace uh, that we may find grace and equip yourself with it, that one day when you need it, you can actually use it. As they say, better to have it and not need it than to need it and, not, and, and don't have it. So training here is not simply just going to RTS or going to RU or you know, going to the Evangelism Institute and et cetera, but training is drawing near to the throne of grace each and every single day. Training is confirming those three things, Acts 1 1, Jesus is a Christ. Confirming that in your life is what training is all about. Acts 1 3, the kingdom of God. Finding what that really even means is what training is. You can go to our view and do a master's in theology, but you have no idea in your own personal life what Acts 1 3, God's kingdom, is all about. What is God's kingdom? Have you heard of this phrase, problem is not a problem, that is the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of the world, it is a problem. When worldly people look at it, it is a problem. But for you, a child of God, through the eyes and the lens of Christ, and look at the same, same thing, it is not a problem. Kingdom of God. Training is experiencing that every day in your life. Training is experiencing Acts 1-8, the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I have no strength, but Christ promised the filling of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when you express these three things, listen carefully here at the end, you'll be able to focus on two, three things. You'll be able to focus on to grace and grace alone. Somebody who is experiencing Acts 1, 1 and Acts 1, 3 and Acts 1, 8 cannot focus on anything else but grace. And because you're focusing on grace, naturally, you have no choice but to focus on salvation. You realize I'm a saved child of God. I'm a saved child of God. That itself, if you ever realize this in your, in your conscience alone, that just tracks you in your head that, hey, I'm a child of God. 
if that ever comes into your conscious, you feel, what do you feel? Forces of darkness are crumbling. You feel that. And then the other thing that you have no choice but to focus when you think about training is you think about sanctification. God can use us anyhow, you know. Can use us in any way. A filthy, um, evil king was used by God to rebuild the temple and the wall in Jerusalem. So it's not really a problem about um, how we are before God, but God can use us in any way. But when you're receiving training and you're entering into grace, you're really enjoying salvation deeply. You see the importance of sanctification as well. And again, sanctification is also another complicated thing that people have really uh, thought about it. A lot of Christians think of salvation in justification as, you know, those three words, right? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's how we're getting saved justification. But when, you, when they think about sanctification, many people think about what they need to do or what they don't need to do. Now, it shifts from by grace alone, by faith alone, or through faith alone, in Christ alone, into becoming now me. But that's not it. Even sanctification is also by grace alone. Through faith alone can be sanctified. And also in Christ alone. So the benefits of training are just, I've just mentioned about a few here today. And I really hope that you can grab hold of God's covenant and really pray for the time schedule of training to come upon us uh, here in BPC. Uh, here again in the last um, stands the high king of heaven who shall stand as we receive the benediction.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Amen.